Hi, this is SynthChaser with SynthChaser.com. We're repairing this Lindrum machine which was water damaged and in really bad shape. In the last part of the video we uh, cleaned the sliders, repaired and replaced the buttons, and recapped the power supply. Now we're going to be troubleshooting the issues with the electronics using the oscilloscope. The first thing that we're going to look into is the, the dead ride voice. The way the Lin drum and many other drum machines work is it has digital samples of the drum sounds stored in these ROM chips. When you press a button or trigger it uh, you know, through the sequencer, uh, the, uh, the drum sound is read in and converted to an analog waveform and played back. So we can see if the problem with the ride voice is coming before or after the ROM is being read. Uh, for example, the ride and the, uh, the crash voices share the exact same circuitry. So the same thing goes on with the ride as goes on with crash. And these are pretty long sounds, so each of them uh, takes up eight ROMs. So all of these ROMs are for the ride voice. All of these ROMs are for the crash voice. So what we can do is we can look at the address pins on these ROMs and see if, if, the address, if, if it's being accessed, if it's being addressed. So first I'm going to take a look at the crash voice. So I'm going to look at one of the pins of the ROM, so let's say pin 8, which is the A0 address line. So 12, 10, 8. So now I'm going to press the crash voice. And you can see that strobing as it's, uh, it's, uh, it's strobing the address 0 line. So let's do the same thing with the ride voice. So I'm going to go to pin 8 of one of the ride ROM chips and I'm going to press the ride button and the ROM is never being accessed so we know the problem is somewhere before the, the reading of the ROM chip. The ROM address lines are set from a ripple counter and the ripple counter is, is set off by a uh, flip-flop when that flip-flop triggers so let's take a look at that flip-flop for the crash voice, which is working. That flip-flop is over here, and we're going to look at pin 6 of the flip-flop, which is the output to the ripple counter. So right now it's high, and I am going to hit crash, and it goes low, and then it resets after the ripple counter uh, has, has done counted, counting. Uh, we can look at the trigger to that. Uh, the, the clock input to this uh, flip-flop is uh, pin, pin 2. Uh, so for this, because it could be quick, I am going to uh, change the triggering mode here. And we'll hit the crash again. And you can see the, the little pulse there coming in. That, uh, that causes that flip-flop to change states. So let's do the same thing over here on the, uh, the flip-flop for the, the ride voice, which is U21. So I'm going to take a look at the, uh, uh, the pulse to make sure that that's coming in okay from the CPU. Oops. Let's try this again. Clear. Uh, so I'm going to hit the ride button. And so that pulse is coming in okay. Now let's take a look. Oops. Let's take a look here at the uh, the output on pin six. Go back to auto mode here. So now let's take a look and see if that goes low, uh, and it doesn't. So the output to this flip flop never changes. So the uh, the flip flop appears to be to be defective. So we're going to change this chip, this uh, flip-flop chip here for the ride voice. So what I'm seeing down here when I've taken the chip off, it, uh, the, the, uh, the leads of all the ICs are dull and, and uh, uh, look like they've, they've gotten damaged. Here there's actually some, uh, some bluish, greenish corrosion, which I would usually see with battery acid being spilled. And actually, or a leaked battery, uh, it actually looks like the uh, the pads here under this IC, you know, have been at least partially eaten away. Um, so uh, e either either there was some battery damage here at some point, or the uh, the water really corroded the the uh, the copper 
on the PCB. But I'm going to check the uh, the traces for continuity and uh, solder in a socket for any IC. So I've changed the flip-flop that initiates the uh, uh, ROM address counting for the uh, the ride voice, and uh, we hear this. We still hear this noise. Uh, that was one of the problems that uh, we pointed out in when we first went through the Lindrum in the first video. There's this random noise, and it's getting kind of annoying, and I think that's the next thing I'm going to track down after I fix Ride. Uh, but, so here's Crash, and here's Ride. So Ride is working, but it's, uh, it's very, very, uh, very, very quiet. And I can see that the Ride is, uh, is now addressing the ROMs. So that's, uh, that was pin 8 here that I was looking at. So I hit ride and I can see that it's addressing the ROMs and reading them. And I can actually look at the uh, the op amp output of, uh, of the analog or the digital to analog converter. So here's crash and here's ride. And you can see that it's got a uh, signal of about the same peak to peak amplitude. So at some point between the uh, here and the output, we're, we're losing that signal, or it's getting greatly attenuated. So the next place that I would check, the next stop that this goes through is a multiplexer, which multiplexes the eight different um, eight different sounds uh, through uh, multiplexer and uh, sends them to individual op amps, uh, which go to the individual outputs and also get mixed by the mixer. So let's see if uh, the output, or the input and the output to the multiplexer, which is this U83 here. So the input to the uh, multiplexer is pin 3. This is a CD4051, which is a 8 to 1 multiplexer, demultiplexer, CMOS chip. So this is the input. I'm going to hit crash. I see the crash signal. I'll hit ride. I see the same ride signal that I see on, uh, on the output of that op amp. The, uh, this uh, inputs to this, um, so that's the input. This is just clocked, so it kind of cycles through all the different voices and, uh, and puts them on their individual lines. So let's look at the, uh, the crash output. So this is crash's output line. I hit crash and, and there I see a nice clean crash waveform. So now let's look at the ride waveform, and I'll hit ride, and I don't see anything. So let me let me make this a little bigger. Yeah, I don't really see anything. So the uh, multiplexer appears to be bad. So I'm going to change the multiplexer, and we'll go from there. So now that I've changed the multiplexer, uh, first of all, I noticed that that uh, random noise is gone. Uh, I have the volume turned up pretty high, and, and the noise was really noticeable even at moderate volume levels before. Uh, so here's crash. See how loud I have it. And ride. Ride is now working. So we've actually killed two birds with one stone with this changing this multiplexer. So now we can move on to the next problem. One other thing I noticed is that tambourine, which formerly was not working, is now working. So the only uh, other voices we have to troubleshoot are the conga and the toms, which are still dead. The toms and the conga don't seem to totally be dead. Uh, intermittently, they make some noise. Like that. So, uh, but nonetheless, we still need to look into this. The toms and the conga share a uh, signal path, so one of them is broken. It's not totally earth shattering that the other one is broken too. So, when you press a, uh, a toms or conga button on the front of the uh, on the front panel, the data bus gets filled with four bit code that says which voice you pressed. So, the data bus D zero through D three uh, is set like this. And this gets latched into a flip-flop, just like with the ride. So I've gone through and I've verified that uh, for each button I press, the correct data is getting sent from the CPU and is getting latched into the flip-flop. 
So much like the ride, then this triggers the reading of the ROMs and the conversion to an analog waveform. So we can take a look and see if that analog waveform is getting generated correctly. Uh, so that is on pin one of this op amp U85. So I'm going to probe this guy and I'm going to press one of the, the voices that we're having problems with. So I see what looks like an audio signal here when I'm pressing mid or I'll do high toms. Uh, so that so far seems to be good in that it's reading the ROMs and generating a uh, analog audio signal. So the next stop uh, after it leaves this is uh, this chip over here which is a Curtis filter chip, a CEM3320. And uh, this, trip, this chip is controlled with a control voltage. The control voltage is set by your turning of the, the tuning pots on the, on the top of the machine. So let's take a look at the control voltage and make sure that that's being passed in correctly. Control voltage is very small amplitude signal. So I'm putting the scope in 50 millivolt setting because I'm expecting a 50 millivolt peak to peak signal. So the Curtis chip pin... 9, 10, 11, 12, wait, 12. Uh, this, is, this is the input of the control voltage. So I'm going to press one of the buttons, and I see a blip that corresponds to about a 50 millivolts. So that, that's fine. Now I'm going to look at the output of the Curtis chip, and I, I hope this one is okay. So this is pin 10, and I'm going to, again, I've got to zoom out on the scope, because this is a, uh, a larger amplitude signal. I'll do it like this. And I'll do again do the uh, the high toms. So there I see my same audio signal that I saw before, although in this case it's been filtered by the Curtis chip, appearing with a DC offset. So it then goes through this electrolytic capacitor right here to remove the DC coupling. So I'm going to peek on the other side of that capacitor and hit the button again. And there's the uh, audio waveform with the, um, with the DC offset removed. So according to the schematics, the next stop is a straight shot over to uh, this chip, U87, which is another CD4051 to one analog uh, demultiplexer. So uh, the same chip that we just replaced to repair ride. So since, since it's a straight shot over, we should see our signal uh, high toms on the input line of that, and we do. And uh, it says that the code, the, the selection code for the high toms is 6. So we'll probe this, uh, this uh, line here with ABC uh, input that says which channel to select or which channel to put the output onto. And uh, that's a high. I'm pressing high toms. And this is just coming from our flip-flop, so I know it's correct. That's a high. <coughs> Oops. Hit, the, hit two buttons there. And that, that's a low. So the output is 110 or 6. So the uh, number 6 output line is pin 2 of the multiplexer. So I'll go over to pin 2. And I'll hit high toms again and I don't see a signal coming out. So the signal is coming in on pin 3. The channel is being selected correctly on the multiplexer, but there's no output. So just like the last one, this is a bad multiplexer chip that we're going to replace. So I replaced that chip, and now the toms work, and the conga works. So uh, I still do here a little bit of noise in the background when I have the volume turned up all the way, so I'm going to take a look into that now. So in order to track this down quicker, I'm going to use the individual outputs on the back. So right now I've been listening to through the mixer, uh, so I hear all the noises from all of the, 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 uh, the drum channels. There's three segments of this uh, drum machine. There's the, the uh, toms and conga section, which we just repaired. There's the uh, snare and side stick is in its own section, and then everything else, the, the first section that we worked on, uh, is in the third, third section. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the output from the back in the mixer, and I'm going to start plugging them into the individual outputs. There's an output for each noise that this machine makes. And we're going to find out which section this noise is coming from. So I'm putting it in the click, and I don't hear anything. I'm putting it in claps, and I hear the noise. I put it in cowbell, I hear the noise. Conga, I don't hear the noise. I'll go down to a snare, I don't hear the noise. So the noise is coming from that first section, which has uh, all of the other ones except for snare, conga, and uh, toms. So I'm going to open this back up and get the oscilloscope out turned on again, and we'll, we'll find where this noise is coming from. So we're going to check out the source of this uh, random noise that we're hearing. And uh, there's the chip that converts the, the ROM data to an analog waveform, and that's buffered with a, uh, uh, an op amp. So we're going to compare the outputs on the op amp from the quiet section when it's not in use, which is this one, the toms and conga. So the output of this op amp is very, very quiet when nothing is being played. And we're going to compare it with the output of the op amp for uh, the, the one with the, uh, the crash and ride and all those other ones, uh, which is this op amp. And we can see that there's, a, there's very clearly some uh, waveform there. And uh, I can, when I probe, I can actually hear a sound, sound coming in. And so this is on the connection between the op amp and the uh, and the uh, digital to analog converter. So we're going to uh, start with replacing this op amp. So I replaced the op amp, uh, and it did not resolve the problem with the noise. Um, so the next thing that I uh, decided to do was replace a pair of metal film resistors that are in the feedback loop of that op amp. Uh, sometimes resistors can add noise. Uh, it looked like there had been some rework done in that area. So I ordered the precision um, metal film resistors and put them in and the noise problem has gone away. Uh, the waveform that I saw on the oscilloscope is still there, uh, but the noise is gone. So now all of the uh, drum sounds of the machine work. And there's no noise aside from some transformer hum. Now that we've got all the drum sounds working, we're going to uh, verify and repair any issues with the programming section of the Lin Drum. And we're going to break that out into another segment of this video series, so be sure to watch part three. This is Synth Chaser saying thanks for watching. Bye.